Hey, this is Josh Modell, host of the Talk House Podcast. We'll be back next week with the first new episode of 2024. But in the meantime, check out this great chat we ran in mid-2023 between two incredible drummers, John Worcester and Stuart Copeland. Worcester, of course, is known as the former drummer of Super Chunk and currently plays with the Mountain Goats and Bob Moulds Band. And Copeland was in one of the biggest bands of the 1980s, The Police. It's a lively episode. Check it out, and we'll see you with new episodes soon. Hi, this is Carrie Brownstein. This is DJ Premier. This is Darren Aronofsky. You got the Rizzo right here. Rose McGowan. Right here. Aisha Tyler. The Tron Conquest. Fred Armisen. Fritz Paul. Javier Munoz, Seth Meyers. Frankie Cosmos. Flying Lotus. Hi, we're Haim, and you're listening to the Talk House Podcast. Hello, and welcome to the Talk House Podcast. I'm Josh Modell. This week, we've got an episode for all the drummers out there, as well as anybody who just likes a great story. We've got John Worcester and Stuart Copeland. Now, Copeland is, of course, the drummer for the legendary gazillion-selling Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, The Police, who were called, quote, the biggest band in the world during their mid-80s heyday. Their hits have endured over the decades, too, and that's in no small part due to the special chemistry the trio enjoyed. And that chemistry, as you'll hear, often manifested itself in fights between Copeland and his old bandmate Sting. Now, Copeland has made a fascinating career for himself since then. He directed a documentary about his old band that made interesting use of their music. And he's got a new album and tour called Police Deranged for Orchestra, which features those classic songs redone in wild new ways. As you'll hear in this chat, Copeland also found a side career as a film composer, working on everything from Oliver Stone's Wall Street to the classic Francis Ford Coppola movie Rumblefish. Check out a little bit of Every Little Thing She Does Is Magic from Police Deranged for Orchestra right here. Now, the other half of this conversation is a drummer from a later era, and as you'll hear, a huge fan of Copeland's work. John Worcester is a renaissance man who's played most regularly with Superchunk, the Mountain Goats, and Bob Mould, but whose list of credits goes way beyond those amazing acts. He's also a comedy writer and half of the duo Sharpling and Worcester, which gave birth to some of the funniest characters in radio comedy ever. This summer, Worcester will tour with both Mountain Goats and Bob Mould, so chances are good that he'll be in a city near you. In this conversation, Worcester, as I hoped he would, gets deep into specifics with Copeland, asking him right off the bat about a very specific gig from the early 1980s that he attended. They also chat about how Copeland's orchestral tours actually work, and about his forays into the soundtrack world. I had never heard the term shit chord before, so that was a good one. They get into the fights that Copeland had with police frontman Sting, and about how band therapy helps sort all that out. Worcester also gets a chance to ask about the lyrics to a deep police cut called On Any Other Day. Enjoy. Well, Stuart, I wanted to start off with one of those deep, deep questions, if possible, just to kind of get it out of the way and to um, to get some closure on, on something that has been hanging over me for decades. I had lunch the other day with Kathy Valentine, who is the bassist for the Go-Go's. Oh, yeah. And we talked about a concert I attended that you both played that was a really formative moment and day in my life. It was um, outside of Philly, August 22nd, 81. At a racetrack, it was the police, the specials, the Go-Go's, Oingo Boingo, and opening 50s legends, the Coasters. Dang, what a lineup. Right? And for years, I, I didn't know why the Coasters were there. And then I think I've heard that they were on it because they played your brother's wedding the previous day. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. And the reason they played my brother's wedding the previous day is because they're one of the first bands my ears pricked up at age seven or something like that, you know? Wow. And just those those loopy kind of poppy yakety sack songs, you know, you know, put out the bring in the dog and put out the cat. <laughs> yakety yak, don't talk back. All that oh. stuff. You really got my young brain. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. In my memory, they came out in these green suits, and it was just so the antithesis of what us young new wave kids were expecting, but we loved it. I didn't actually see that show, uh, probably because I was hung over from my brother's wedding and did not rise. Well, the Coasters and Oingo Boingo, Specials and Go-Go's, that's a lineup. 
I mean, it's, it was insane. It, I still talk about it almost every day because it was such a great, a great day. And I played my first gig ever the night before. So it was a magical weekend. Excellent. Yeah. So let's start with Police Deranged for Orchestra. I was curious how you picked the songs for it. Well, they came from the the original derangements where I did the same messed up versions using actual police recordings, live studio and others. So I've got the orchestral version of the derangements and I've got the police version of them as evidence. Yep. That bass line there, Sting did play it. It's Stingish. Right. And Andy as well. A lot of these figures came. And the reason I did this deranging in the first place was to score my little Super 8 movie, which um, I shot back in the day and which sat in shoeboxes for decades until they invented computers. And I could actually digitize that footage and make a little movie. And that movie needed a score. And it's about the police. It's me shooting all the police, you know, kicking the doors open of our motel rooms. And it needed to be police music, but I figured alternative police music. And so that's where I found and went through the mission of finding all these uh, scraps of obscure policiana. When you do this live, it's almost like Chuck Berry, where Chuck Berry would go into a town and play with a new band. Obviously, we're talking about much greater musicianship. But is it something like that where you sh- you come in? It's and, exactly and organ- like it that. Is. Wow. In fact, that is our band joke as we pull into town, <laughs> you know, hire the local high school band. Wow. And count them in. Oh, my God. Y'all know Roxanne, right? It's a little different. I feel like Chuck Berry just because I feel who wouldn't want to feel like Chuck Berry. <laughs> right. But it's a little different. Instead of hiring the local high school band, we hire the Atlanta Symphony. Yeah. The, the Chicago Symphony, the, you know, the Pittsburgh Philharmonic Orchestra. And those are not high schoolers. Those are flinty-eyed, top (laughs) world-class musicians. And we have two and a half hour rehearsal. Sort that's where it's sort of like Chuck Berry. Wow! Uh, Except that he—I don't think he even did that. No, no. uh, (laughs) Hey, y'all know Maybelline, right? Two, (laughs) three, four. Uh, So it's a little slightly different, but yeah, I like feeling like Chuck Berry. And I assume because you know the song so well at this point, you get to even though I—I guess the songs are a specific. or, or are they a specific number of, of bars with the orchestra? But but you get to stretch Absolutely. out, I would imagine. You get to kind of have fun, though, right? Absolutely. They're, they are on the page. They do not vary. They don't improvise. They're not okay. guitarists. These guys, their whole ethos is to obey the page, to faithfully reproduce exactly what the page says. You know, the melody isn't da-da-da-da-da-da-da, da 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 and all that articulation Uh, I call it putting the Italian on the page. All that stuff tells them not just what notes to play, but how to play them. And if they obey that page, every little staccato dot and tenuto and every, all the information that's on the page, if they obey the page religiously, then they collectively will be the mighty Chicago Symphony Orchestra. (laughs) Right. And their ego is collective. It's part of being the thing. And part of being the thing is to play the page. So they are faithfully playing the page, I am not. Oh. I'm going all over the place. Since I know exactly where they're going to be, right. I can really screw around. I'll take a diversion. Hey, guys, I'm going to take a left here. I'll see, you in, I'll see you at the double bar line. I'll see you in eight bars. And uh, I can go on excursions because I know exactly where they will be. But they probably aren't super used to that, are they? Well, uh, what they are used to is the classics written by the great composers of all time. And I'm doing my humble little best here, but I ain't no Mahler. Uh, I wish I was, but um, new charts for some orchestras are easier than others. Right. And, And they can play the classics, the core classics in their sleep because they studied them in school. They've got 10 different albums with renderings and it's very easy for them to play a difficult, difficult piece like rites of spring is insanely difficult, but they all know it because they grew up with it. Whereas my music is a little easier to play than Rites of Spring, but they don't know it. And so they learn it very quickly in two and a half hours. Wow. And then we play the show that night. Are the singers new also every night? No, the singers are a core group. Uh, There's actually five of them, but there's only three at a time. And because they're triple scale LA singers, you know, they're very much in demand. And I can't have them all, but they can read batshit on the page. Wow. And they can deliver. And they all know these songs now and they know the style of the show. 
And so they are improvising, taking the lead, stepping forward into the spotlight, shining. They're really very charismatic, these women, given the chance, you know, because it takes a lot of, it takes more skill to be a session singer than it does to be a star singer. Mm -hmm. But these women have all those skills. Plus, when they step forward, they've really got some shine on them. And do you write the charts? Yes. Wow, amazing. There's one of them that I did not write, which is Every Breath You Take. And I I had just done the whole thing. And I thought, you know what? They're going to come after me with pitchforks if I don't do Every Breath. That's the big hit. Yeah. But at that point, I'd, I'd kind of burnt out with it all. So I, I farmed that one out to an actual professional orchestrator. Uh, right. <laughs> but the rest of them, all, I, did, I did all the charts myself. And this was a skill that I learned involuntarily from my 20 years as a hired gun film composer. I got right. an involuntary education in orchestra. Touching on that, I got to spend a, a week earlier in the year making a record in Tulsa, and I'd never really gotten to spend much time there. And it, it was funny when I was walking around, I was hearing the Rumblefish music in my head the whole time. And it was, it was really cool. And I wanted to tell you that it, there were even some little nods to the movie in restaurants and things, uh, like little pictures yes. and, and some graffiti. And I wanted to know what Tulsa means to you. Well, it's a very funky town. And um, I was there when they were rehearsing the movie and then when they were shooting it as well. Wow. And, you know, the, the cast and crew are all holed up in a hotel and go to the set and, and work. And my memory of Tulsa is colored by seeing the movie, which is in black and white and all atmosphere and lighting and everything like that. OK, by day in color, Tulsa is not quite that atmospheric, but it is a cool city. Yeah. There's a great gig there, too. What was it called? Kane's Ballroom. Yep. Played there a few times. They still have uh, framed in, in the back room the piece of wall that Sid Vicious punched when they <laughs> played there. I'm sure that's very decorative, <laughs> by the way. It, it is. It's framed. <laughs> um, yeah. Talking about soundtrack composing, I assume you probably have a bunch of ideas for each film and some stuff doesn't get used. Do you ever use those things for the next movie? Absolutely. You do. I use them even if they have been used. I found that under pressure is when the really good stuff happens. When I did yeah. episodic TV, when I did Equalizer, when I did Dead Like Me, just having to churn and burn, uh, you get into a rhythm and you can't think. You haven't got time for thinking. You just go straight to the deep place where the music comes from yeah. and it, p- it picks up momentum. And the little three note tricks, the bass lines, the cool stuff. Just those cool little moments of inspiration come fast and furious when you're under the gun. And so I do go back in there and I find little themes from Equalizer or Spyro particularly really generated a lot of really cool little little figures, right. which I still use. And it's not because I'm, I'm out of ideas. It's because those ideas were just so cool. I want to use it and I can quote it right there. And it gives me great joy to give a new flash in the pan for one of those cool ideas. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. So where do you start on a movie? Like, all right, so you're hired to do Wall Street. Do you start with the title or or how does it work? Well, I watched the movie. Right. In that case, they already had a score, which they threw out. I won't mention the name of the very illustrious composer, one of the greats, but the director felt that, Oliver Stone felt that it was too polished, too nice, too, too beautiful. And he wanted something with a bit of grind, a bit of dirt. So he called me and I watched the movie and watching it. I sort of came up with a concept, had him had a meeting with uh, Oliver and said, you know what? I hear dogs, dogs, uh-huh. dogs. Yes. Because this world is just a snarling, rapacious, carnivorous world, which I think the sound subliminal sound of snarling dogs would be just perfect for these people. And uh, Oliver's eyes lit up, said, right, hired. Wow. And by the way, I've used that same gag because it went down so well with Oliver on 10, the next 10 (laughs) meetings I had with, you know what? I hear dogs. And the director (laughs) goes, yeah, cool. Of course, in the real world of film composing and studios and such, they don't want to hear dogs. No. The the director (laughs) might have been excited by the concept, but the studio, no, they want to hear nice music because that's what the folks expect. Yeah, And so I've gotten many a gig by doing the dog routine, but ended up not doing dogs because that's not what they really, when they say, we just want you to think outside the box. Well, I have two responses. One is 
where is that box? <laughs> right. And the other is, I know that they want it to be absolutely within the parameters of that box. Right. Have fun, but not too much fun. <laughs> well, yeah. What's next is that, okay, get the gig, hired. So we sit down and watch the movie and figure out. And the director says, you know, here, when she looks over and says, I love you, uh, we need for us not to believe her. So give me a shit chord when she says that beautiful thing. And then the audience, they believe the music more than their lying eyes. Their lying eyes tells you that it's all beautiful. Yeah. My shit chord tells them otherwise. And they believe the music rather than what they see. Wow. I've never thought that. That's really cool. Wow. So the director tells the composer, okay, dramatically, the pictures are saying this, but I want the audience to know that or to feel more importantly, I want the audience to feel suspicious Yeah. or or trusting, or cheerful, or sad, or whatever. And it's the emotional message of the movie. That's what the director comes to the composer for. You were talking about being being under the gun and, and how, how that's when, you know, at crunch time, that's when you really excel. That, from what I've learned over the years, that was a real component of your drum tracks for the police. You pretty much just learned the song an hour before, I guess, and you have to pull something together. Is that safe to say? Yeah, I'd say it's closer to 20 minutes, though. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, Stenko had a great technique, which was he would only reveal his songs on an as-needed basis. Okay. And so um, he'd pull out a song. We thought, cool, let's do that. And we work on it. We record it. And we're like, great, great, great. And we're just congratulating ourselves. Like, wow, we really kick our ass. Pregnant pause. Stingo. Okay, mm -hmm. I got another song. Great, let's work on that. And uh, so... He would reveal his songs at exactly the right moment, and we would leap on them like piranhas yeah. and uh, dissect them, pull them apart, figure them out. Um, you know, basically, Sting and Andy head together, figuring out the chords while I'm tapping my knees. And then we do a take. And that take, maybe second or third take, is the record that I'm stuck with for eternity. Right. While they get they get to redo all their bass and guitar overdubs and vocals for eternity. Well, that, that's what's so cool about your performances on these records is that, that they're so iconic, but then you realize, oh, that was just that performance. If, if they'd gone with take three, it would be a whole new batch of iconic fills. But I'm sure it's, it's, it was pretty, you know, it, very intense while it was happening. Yes. Um, and very inspired. You know, we would go out on tour with those same songs, and eventually I'd figure out a really cool way of getting back down from the chorus, back down into the verse. I figure out that transition. Oh, that's how I should have done it on the record. Right. Uh, but the record does kind of work. And I think that the lack of exactitude and composition of those transitions, I just did them on the fly. They, they could have been done more effectively, perhaps. But I think the, the X factor of inspiration oh, makes yeah. up for that. And I think you can feel the exploratory atmosphere of those recordings. They're so exciting. And you're known for these incredibly creative, you know, fills and things and, 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 you know, turning the rhythms on, on, on their sides and stuff, but you're an amazing timekeeper also. Like I was listening to King of pain and it's almost like Al Jackson jr. There, I think there's one fill at the end. And that was something I learned just in the last few weeks, really listening closely to songs like that, where, yeah, this guy is a groove King also. Was that important to you? Well, it's about the baseline. Uh, the bass player getting in and, and the drummer getting in, getting locked, finding the pocket. And that's something that Sting and I were very good at. How different was it playing with Stanley Clark or uh, Les Claypool, people like that? Very, very different. Les Claypool and Stanley Clark are ex extreme, you know, uh, well, no, they both have a lot of the same, same qualities, but they're so different as well. Just yeah. their musical, their musical personality is, is very different even though they have the same skill set and Stingo as well. Um, although in later years, we kind of grew apart because, you know, long story, we just make music for different reasons. Yeah. And Armand Sabaleko, with whom I've been playing for something like 30 years now from Cameroon, just has that African lilt that lights me up every time. I've always been fascinated by band dynamics, even though I've, I've, I've been in bands forever. I, I'm always interested in what other bands are like what's happening i i do that too by the way oh, do on, you? Yeah. on tour oh yeah i cross-examine the other bands. So, yes. so what's up with your band how's it work you know, ah. who are the passengers who are the who are the builders oh i love that term the passengers well yeah i gotta write that down 
<laughs> that's why I was in a three piece, no passengers <laughs> yes. and passengers, by the way, can some, sometimes be very, you know, can contribute a lot. If it's just bedside right. manner, right. somehow it's part of the cohesion of the band. There are many bands that have passengers, but those passengers are actually quite useful. How would you describe Henry's role in, in the, in the early band? And I guess it was a four piece for a couple shows. Yeah, just two or three shows. We had both guitarists, but Henry was a, a utilitarian choice, yeah. as were the songs written in that period, which I wrote, which were not great songs. I didn't even see myself as a songwriter, never did any singing, but I needed punk songs because we were supposed to be a punk band. And so I came up with these two or three chord tricks, riffs, basically bass lines with yelling. Right. And that was our <laughs> early material. And, and Henry was able to deliver that stuff very convincingly, yeah. but he just didn't have a wide enough musical vocabulary to light Stingo up. I mean, he was playing the part. He was, you know, he was doing the whole punk rama thing because that was our gig. Yeah. But then when we heard Andy, it sort of reminded me, oh, yes, I remember this wonderful thing called music. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, after our first session where we, you know, we were a rhythm section for hire. And the guitarist on the session was Andy Summers. And we drove home that night thinking, oh, my God, can you imagine if we had that stuff going on? But yeah. never mind. You know, Sting was all lit up. And Sting was tell, you know, saying, man, we got to get a better guitarist, man. You know, you're a better guitarist right. than Henry. And you suck. <laughs> and, and for a minute there, I was taken aback. I, you know, this unexpected accolade. And I'm going, really? And uh, anyway. I didn't have to worry because I knew that we could never afford Andy. He was never going to join us a couple of fake punks with no material. Right. Um, and by the way, he did join a couple of fake punks with no material. And we didn't have any material until sometime later. He joined a band that did not have Roxanne or Message in a Bottle or any of those songs that are worth a darn. Right. I asked him recently, Andy, what were you thinking? <laughs> right. Leaving behind all of that lucrative session work to join two fake punks with nothing going on. He says, I don't know, mate. Should have stuck with Neil Sadaka. I don't think I've ever heard you talk about working with John Cale on that first session. What was that like? Well, we worked with John Cale because he was super cool. Velvet Underground, you know, that is instant coolness. And yeah. we very much lacked coolness. We were absolutely uncool. And we thought that maybe an association, some of his coolness could neutralize some of our uncoolness. But he didn't really get the police. He saw us pretty much the same way everyone else did. Um, you know, Velvet Underground were a rebellion against yeah. techno flash musicians um, like us. And we, you know, we were sort of like surly teenagers you know, skeevy teenagers at the, at the tween party, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so he didn't really know quite what to do with us. And so he sat in the control room and read newspapers while we got our shit together and recorded a couple of tracks. And, and by the way, we were not able to siphon off any of his coolness. I we were you. just as uncool <laughs> after working with John Cale as we were before. Well, well, what's interesting about this is that as a, you know, basically, there was no baggage that came with the police in America. You know, you're right. In America, we were virgins. It was un the fact that we were so unhip was just not known. Yeah. In fact, they didn't read the NME or the Melody Maker. Uh, and uh, we'd show up in Atlanta, play a gig or in Philadelphia or Boston yeah. and play a show. And they'd heard this cool new thing from England. Cool. And we'd come out and we'd do our thing. And they liked it. But so great about about those records is that they sounded so different than what was on FM radio at the time. And, you know, there, there's such a, um, I guess you would call it like an economy of, of playing. There's a lot of space on those records. And I think that really made an impression on people. Well, that's the way that punk did affect the police, yeah. which was that straitjacket, that constrainment of chops and focusing on the groove, on the totality of the music rather than noodling chops. That discipline actually stuck with us even though it was punk rules right. and we shook off all the other punk rules but the discipline part we held on to because we just sort of figured that we can do all this school stuff but it's way better when we don't talking about punk i know you made a couple singles with brian james from the damned but did you have a, a relationship with anyone in the clash or 
or uh, the Stranglers or a- any of those bands. Yeah. I know, I know Chelsea also. Yeah, Chelsea were but good buddies. Gene October and his various bands that you know the, the difference. You know, Chelsea, Gene October, and Billy Idol were kind of a mash. You never knew who was in Gen X or who was in Chelsea. Yeah. Or, you know, was it? You know, they were all kind of a, a, a scene, and they were a good hang. All those people, but there was other American bands who came over from New York, the Heartbreakers. Uh, Wayne County and the electric chairs, they were the best hang of all. And the specials of, you know, all those, all those bands of that period, we all did hang out. The early okay. punk scene, Clash, Damned, and Pistols were the top three at the time. They were the lords of the universe yeah. uh, in 1977. And the Damned were friends, you know, Captain Sensible, Brian James, was good buddy. Uh, Rat was the closest he got to Keith Moon uh, yeah. in those days. The, the Clash, I got to know The Clash a little bit later. In fact, Paul Simonon and Sting bonded over bass technique, you know. Really? He was actually interested in his instrument and becoming a real musician. Just yeah. don't tell Joe Strum. <laughs> yeah. As a kid, one thing that was really appealing was this, what I saw as the IRS FBI universe with you and, and your two brothers. And it just seemed like the coolest thing. I felt like these guys are creating their whole world with like the cramps and the beat and scave fish and all that what did that feel like on your end or were you just caught up in in the the storm of what you were doing at the time well we had to me from our point of view what it looked like was stable mates yeah. you know the specials and the cramps we did lots of shows together and kind of bonded with them and scave fish and wasmo and the reasons fashion and some of these other groups flock of seagulls you know we we were on tour we hung out and we kind of became buddies uh all these different bands yeah and so the empire created by my two brothers miles and ian kept it constant i mean we we had better relate could we do more shows with those stable bands than with other people also when i was a kid one of the records i played along to the most was a bootleg of the show you guys did at, at uh, hatfield polytechnic for uh rock for college is that what it was called yeah, something like that. Oh my God, that was my favorite. Rock goes to college. Yes, yeah, that was my favorite record, and I never knew there was video of it until you know until like ten years ago. And it's such a wild night. What do you remember about it? Like everyone's crazy at, at this show. Well, in the early days uh, of our success, the early days of our non-success, I remember that. In fact, I've I've, I've just been working on a book, you know, ba- built on my diaries from that period. Um, but when it all started to happen, it started to happen first for us after our struggles as a fake punk band, yeah. crossing America, you know, getting our thing together, all the trials and tribulations. We start for a year and a half, a couple of years before it started to break. And when it did break, we emerged as, of all things, a boy band. Yeah. And we, and, and we were on all the covers of all the teeny bopper magazines looking, looking pretty with our three blonde heads. Right. And so <laughs> Hatfield... Polytechnic was somewhere in that period where we were burning down the house every night for kind of fans of our music as well as screaming tweens. Yeah. There's a particular sound that young females make when they're <laughs> excited, sort of like what piranha, piranha fish would sound like if they, they made a sound. Right. It's, it's, it's much <laughs> higher pitched than a Rage Against the Machine audience. I bet. Did you ever get to meet or hang out with any of the great reggae drummers like uh, Carlton Barrett or Sly or Leroy Wallace? Any of those? Yeah. Guys? Yeah. We, we also played with a lot of those bands, Oswad and, and such. Steel Pulse. A lot of those, yeah. Steel Pulse. Absolutely. A lot of shows with them. Wow. And yeah, we did. And Robbie as well. And wow. um, we trade chops. They were just completely different. That's where I was looking for inspiration. Because the reggae drummer is playing a drum solo all night. He's playing every fill. He's busier by far yeah. than your average rock drummer. Yeah. And it's it's upside down. And it leads me <laughs> it leads me to a question about a, a song that you have called a rhythmic nightmare that comes in on the back of nowhere. Um Spirits in the Material World. Are you starting to count on the end of three? Is that what's happening? One, two, lump dum da lum. Two, okay. One, two, three, four, one, and two, and three. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. It's actually, it's because it's so spare yeah. and there's no real connecting tissue. The guitar up chop is all alone. The yeah. bass line is all by itself. The drums are behind the back of nowhere. 
and it's on the knife's edge of disaster at all times. <laughs> so it's the simplest, but actually the most unbalanced, the most fraught with danger riff in our oh, yeah. in the repertoire. I have no idea how how the three of you could even end at the same time on that reason. Well, when I play it with the orchestras, it's <laughs> challenging. It's it, we play it mostly with just the, the three piece band, the keyboard part. Yeah. About half the time I have to say, uh, tacit keyboard. Right. Um, which is orc talk for uh shut up keyboard. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> because they couldn't get the up they just they, they end up on the downbeat and it all goes to hell. Yeah. And so um we often nick the keyboard part on that. I think we're about eleven days away from the fortieth anniversary of the release of Synchronicity. And that period seems really interesting because you're the biggest band in the world, but it all seems like it's about to implode. Um, what was that that period like for you? Uh, kind of miserable. Yeah, We had enjoyed the rise to success and got all of the thrills that derive from that climb to success. Then we sat there. For two yeah. albums, we were playing stadiums. Yeah. And the albums became more and more difficult to record because we were driving each other crazy. Now, we all understand why we were driving each other crazy, and we all appreciate the result of driving each other crazy yeah. was um, something that we're very happy with, but it was not easy. You know, right. I've often described the police as a, like a Prada suit made out of razor blades. Yeah. <laughs> you have that have a great quote that something like every instinct I have is the opposite of what makes Sting happy. Well, I, I don't think I ever put it in exactly those terms, but it's not far off the mark. Yeah. And, and and it's not so much a complaint as a recognition. Yeah. That when we were young and codependent, all we couldn't get enough of each other's stuff and we lit each other up. Um, but album after album, you know, as time went on, we did kind of grow into different shapes. Yeah. And fundamentally, we make music for different reasons. It has a different function in our life. The kind of music we want to listen to as well as the kind of music we want to make and how we make the music are right. just on different planets. And we understand that it's that contrast that makes the police made the police what it was. Yeah. But it's not comfortable. It's not easy. When you were done with the reunion tour, did everybody feel like, okay, we did it. We don't need to do it again. That's right. And I would advise any of those bands to get on with it, do the reunion tour because there's so many reasons for you to be copacetic. Yeah. And the things that drive you apart are really superficial. And it is a great feeling to actually bury the hatchet, understand it all, and get on with life appreciating what each other brought into our lives. We actually did have band therapy. Oh, you did? Wow. What was that like? <laughs> a little goopy. Uh, you know, we, we, we just realized that, wait a minute, we're doing this incredible tour. Everybody's having the best tour ever. Yeah. The promoter's selling more tickets. Tickets. The publicist has got every publication, you know, calling for, you know, just everybody. The, the catering is having people volunteer to work for free. Everybody's having the best tour ever, except for two guys. Right. And I heard somewhere that the Rolling Stones had banned therapy. Cool. And so I, I, you know, threw my toys out of the press and said, we need banned therapy. Why are we so miserable? And so we got um, a couple of different people. One was like a shrink who came and met with each of us and. He told me that, you know, you are a, actually, you are a, um, a psychic and a shaman. And I'm going, really? Well, that's cool. I feel better already. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a psychic. Wow, I never knew. Uh, how come I didn't sense that? And then I realized he's telling that to Andy, too, and that kind of popped the bubble. But uh, then we got another, a pair, and we sat cross-legged and stared into each other's eyes and put our hands on each other's hearts and right. said a bunch of stuff. And the yeah. stuff that came out of our mouths just blew each other's minds. Really? When I said this, you thought that? Oh. And, you know, I'd, I'd seen Sting as this impregnable fortress. Um, and I was there trying to find chinks in the armor. I could sh stab with my javelin and uh, achieving no result discernibly. But it turned out every thrust, every cut of the knife found its mark. Uh, and so... We sort of figured it out, what the problems were, right. and we got along famously ever since, although he's trying to sing his beautiful song, and back over his left shoulder is World War III, right. and, I, and I'm trying to 
be nice to the song because the song is so beautiful. And I guess he's singing some really wonderful words. And I'm trying to be a good boy. But you know what? I'm on stage and God damn it, I'm banging shit. And I just do what I do. And so we still had an uncomfortable musical relationship. But in front of us was 80,000 people who were very, very happy to see us doing what we were doing. And that was kind of the referee. And those people have no idea that this is even going on. Well, sometimes they might have got an inkling yeah. when Sting turns around and starts <laughs> right. screaming at me and waving his hand to show me where the backbeat is supposed oh. to be. Uh, that might have been a clue. I was impressed that you, di- as far as I know, you didn't have fuck off, you cunt, on the, t- on the drums for the reunion tour. Is that Well, that I, was in a much more, I was in a more <laughs> cheerful frame of mind. Right, right. And by the way, and the whole atmosphere around the band was keep everybody happy. Yeah. You know, conflict avoidance, anything that might cause conflict. No, remove, remove. And, uh, and it, you know, because by the way, after our therapy and we emerged from the therapy going, Hey, great. I, we love each other. All we want to do is be together. And we now get it. We love each other. Okay. Guys wanted to add another three months to the tour. And so it was in everybody's interests for the band to get along. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I have you here. I got it. I got to know the answer. When you say the other ones are complete bullshit, what are you referring to? Uh, the lyrics that I actually wrote for the song. Oh, interesting. I okay. had some I had some dog roll, just complete bullshit, which actually ended up to be the lyrics that are on the record. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and the other ones, you know, I had just done a, a demo of of what I thought should be the lyrics. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, wait a minute, that, that other thing you were singing there sound much better than these. It's all, all serious and with good punctuation and so on. And I go, but the other ones are complete bullshit. Well, oh, uh, okay. And, but the other ones that are complete bullshit are actually the lyrics on the record. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, my God. By the way, I do have that recording of those other lyrics. Oh, my uh, God. In the vault. Wow. All right. Um, what was it like bringing in, all right, Sting has meshes in a bottle. He's got a so lonely rock stand under his belt. What's it like bringing in a song like bombs away that you've written that he has to sing? Not so easy. You know, Andy and I both felt like the George Harrison's of the band. Yeah. Uh, not because we had any doubt in our own gifts, but it was more just a recognition of the exaggerated gifts that Sting had. He just had this knack for coming up with riffs that we all three wanted to play. Sting would be grumpy if we all showed up at the studio without songs, like he's the only one doing any homework. So we all absolutely worked as hard as we could to produce songs for the band. And I kind of liked him, and Andy kind of liked his songs too. But then Sting would pull out Message in a Bottle. <laughs> Let's work on that. Right, right. And so it was not as much fun working on Bombs Away because it, the band didn't have that juice. They were just sort of like humoring me. Yeah. And, um, that's, that's the way it felt anyway. And without leaning forward and firing ideas and how can we make this better? They kind of came out the way we produced them and nobody argued, okay, let's record it. And like that done without that interaction. Uh, so it wasn't as much fun doing bombs as a way as it was doing a uh, message in a bottle. Yeah. What was the most takes of a song you've ever done? Was there like a song that was just inc- like a, a huge struggle to get down? Maybe every little thing she does is magic. Uh, we tried every different version. We tried the reggae version, the punk version, the jazz version. We tried every which way. But the best version, none of our versions were better than the demo that Sting brought. Um, and so eventually we thought, screw it. Okay, Stingo, just run that demo down. Shout me through the changes. And um, I did a take one grumpy caffeinated morning. Uh, one take right there. Those are the drums. And we built the rest of the track from there. That's amazing, though, that you're just playing along with a, dem- a demo that probably just had like a doot, 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 a, a, a click or something. Is that right? Yeah. Well, not a click. A, um, a Actually, quite a sophisticated drum box. Oh, there was. Might've, okay. Yeah. Might have even had changes in it by the way, by that oh time. Oh, my God. Wow. Well, that's a testament to your playing that that I would never I would never think of that. <laughs> it's funny. The song is, every little thing she does is magic. The drummer's really grumpy and banging <laughs> shit. <laughs> right? <laughs> um. Bob Dylan once said that that the video for that was one of his favorite videos. That's a nice thing for Bob Dylan to say. Yeah, right? My goodness gracious me. I'm all lit up at that notion. We were just hamming it up. 
it was just before the high concept videos start to happen. In those days, he just hosed the band down with a camera and the camera frolics around doing things like the monkeys and looking cute. Yeah. And that's your video. So they came to the studio and played the song and we left around and I think Andy might have jumped on the console and we all, it, lo it looks like we're all trashing the console, but actually we're not at all trashing the console. We lived in that room. We needed that console. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so it looks like we're climbing around on it, but we're climbing around very carefully and very athletically because it was so long, that giant SSL desk, the way to get from here to over there was over the top of it rather than all the long way around. Right. And we were young, fit, and bouncy. So we bounced around on the console. Oh, that's so cool. Um, who plays the harmonica on So Lonely? So Lonely? There's, a, there's just like a harmonica? A there's a tiny blast of harmonica just for like two seconds. Well, none of the band played harmonica. You know, most likely Sting. He might have had one in his pocket. He never developed it. Although okay. he did oboe, saxophone, all these other instruments, lute. Um, he can pick up any instrument and something beautiful is going to happen. Oh, yeah. And so the harmonica there, I don't recall the harmonica on there. But if there was, I'm going to go with guessing that it was Sting. Well, gosh, that's about all I got. Terrific. That's almost an hour. An hour. Is, is that enough for you? Thanks for listening to the Talk House podcast. And thanks to John Worcester and Stuart Copeland for chatting. If you liked what you heard, please follow Talk House on your favorite podcasting platform and check out all the great stuff at TalkHouse.com. This episode was produced by Myron Kaplan and the Talk House theme is composed and performed by The Range. See you next time.